Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can. In the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank and a member of DIC. This is Space Time Series 25, Episode 126, for broadcast on the 23rd of November, 2022. Coming up on Space Time, Hubble captures three faces of an evolving supernova, different snapshots in time of the same event. A new study claims planets grow together with their host stars. And a United States Space Force shuttle returns to Earth from a record-breaking mission. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. NASA's Hubble Space Telescope has imaged three different moments at once in a far-off supernova explosion that happened 11 billion years ago. The chance discovery reported in the journal Nature was made thanks to a phenomenon known as gravitational lensing. It's provided astronomers with the first detailed look at an ancient supernova from a time when the universe was just a fraction of its current age. The observations will help scientists learn more about the formation of stars and galaxies in the early universe. The supernova images are also special because they're showing the early stages of a stellar explosion which are often missed. But it's the gravitational lensing effect which provided three snapshots at different time periods of the same event which are most intriguing. First predicted by Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity, which tells us that mass bends space-time and thus light, gravitational lensing meant the light from a distant supernova was refracted and magnified by a foreground galaxy cluster known as Abel 370 acting as a sort of cosmic lens. And as the light travelled around the cluster in different directions, it covered different distances. And because of the slowing of space-time and the curvature of space due to gravity, it resulted in three different images, each showing a different moment in time in the supernova's evolution. One of the study's authors, Wenli Chen from the University of Minnesota, says it's quite rare that a supernova can be detected at such an early stage in its evolution because that stage is usually really short. It only lasts for a few hours to a few days and can be easily missed even for a nearby detection. But even more amazing was this ability to see a sequence of multiple images, multiple faces of a supernova. The Hubble exposure also captured the fading supernova's rapid change of colour, which indicates temperature change. Bluer the colour, the hotter the supernova is. The earliest phase captured appears really blue. But as the supernova cooled, its light turned more red. It all comes about because as the core collapses, it produces a massive shock wave. That heats up the surrounding space, then you're seeing that cool over the following week. Importantly, it's also the first time astronomers were able to measure the size of a dying star in the early universe. That was based on the supernova's brightness and the rate of cooling, both of which depends on the size of the progenitor star. Hubble observations show that the red supergiant whose supernova explosion the researchers discovered was about 500 times larger than the Sun. Chen and colleagues found the supernova by sifting through Hubble data archives looking for transient events. This report from NASA TV. NASA's Hubble Space Telescope captured three separate moments in a far-off supernova explosion in a single snapshot. These moments provide a unique glimpse into the supernova's early life. It is quite rare to detect a supernova explosion at a very early stage. Because that stage is so short, it only lasts for hours to a few days, and it can be easily missed. The star exploded more than 11 billion years ago, when the universe was less than one-fifth of its current age of 13.8 billion years. In a single exposure, Hubble captured the supernova's rapid change of color, which indicates temperature change. The early, hotter phase appears blue. As the supernova cooled, its light turned redder. 
This detection was possible through a phenomenon called gravitational lensing, as first predicted by Einstein's theory of general relativity. In this case, the immense gravity of the galaxy cluster, Abel 370, both bent and magnified the light from the more distant supernova located behind the cluster, like a giant cosmic lens. This lensing effect split and warped the supernova's light, bending it along separate pathways of varying lengths. The different travel times between each path created a time delay that produced three distinct images of the explosion at different times that arrived at Earth simultaneously. This is the first detailed look at a supernova at such an early time of the universe's evolution. The research could help scientists learn more about the formation of stars and galaxies in the young universe. This is space time. Still to come. A new study claims that planets grow with their host stars, and the United States Space Force Space Shuttle returns to Earth from a record-breaking mission. All that and more still to come on Space Time. A new study of so-called polluted white dwarfs suggests that stars and planets grow together. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Astronomy, means that planet formation in our solar system started much earlier than previously thought, with the building blocks of planets growing at the same time as the proto-sun. The findings are based on observations of some of the oldest stars in the universe and suggest that the building blocks of planets like, say, Jupiter and Saturn began to form while the young proto-star was still growing. It had been thought that planets only form once the stars reached its final size, but the new results suggest that stars and planets grow up together. The research changes science's understanding of how planetary systems form, including our own solar system, potentially solving a major puzzle in astronomy. The study's lead author Amy Bonsor from the University of Cambridge says scientists have a pretty good idea of how planets form, but one outstanding question has always been when they form. Does planet formation start early, when the parent star is still growing, or millions of years later? To try and answer this question, Bonsor and colleagues studied the atmospheres of white dwarf stars. White dwarfs are the ancient dead stellar corpses of stars like our Sun. And by studying these stars, they were able to investigate the building blocks of planetary formation. That's because the thin atmospheres of white dwarfs can act as sort of celestial graveyards. See, normally, the interior of planets are out of reach of telescopes. But a special class of white dwarfs, known as polluted systems, have heavy elements such as magnesium, iron and calcium in their normally clean atmospheres. It's thought these elements have come from small bodies like asteroids left over from planetary formation which have crashed into the white dwarfs and burned up in their atmospheres. As a result, spectroscopic observations of polluted white dwarfs can probe the interiors of these torn-up asteroids, giving astronomers direct insight into the conditions in which they formed. Planetary formation is believed to begin in the protoplanetary disk, made up primarily of hydrogen, helium and tiny particles of ice and dust, which are orbiting around young protostars. Now, according to the current leading theory on how planets form, dust particles which condense out of the gas begin sticking together through static electricity until they become massive enough for gravity to take over, eventually forming larger and larger bodies. Now, some of these larger bodies will continue to accrete, becoming protoplanets and then planets, and others will remain as asteroids, like those that crashed into the white dwarfs in the current study. The authors analysed spectroscopic observations from the atmospheres of 200 polluted white dwarfs from nearby galaxies. They found the mixture of elements seen in the atmospheres of these white dwarfs can only be explained if the original asteroids had once melted, which would have caused heavy iron to sink to the core of the asteroid while lighter elements floated on the surface in the mantle. This process, known as differentiation, is what causes the Earth, for example, to have an iron-rich core. Bonsall says in the case of asteroids, the cause of the melting can only be attributed to very short-lived radioactive elements which existed in the earliest stages of planetary system formation, but which decay away in just a few million years. 
In other words, if these asteroids were melted by something which only exists for a very brief time at the dawn of the planetary system, then the process of planetary formation needs to kick off fairly quickly. The study suggests that the early formation picture is likely to be correct, meaning big planets such as Jupiter and Saturn would have had plenty of time to grow to their current sizes. The study also complements a growing consensus among astronomers that planetary formation does start early, with the first bodies forming concurrently with a host star. The analysis of polluted white dwarfs is telling astronomers that this radioactive melting process is a potentially ubiquitous mechanism affecting the formation of all extrasolar planets. This is space time. Still to come. A new prototype robotic Venus balloon aces its first fly tests on Earth, a United States Space Force shuttle returns to Earth from a record-breaking mission, and later in the science report, China develops its own copy of America's stealth bomber. All that and more still to come on Space Time. A scaled-down version of an aerobot which could one day take to the super-dense skies of Venus has successfully completed two test flights in the skies of Nevada, marking a major milestone in the project. As well as being Earth's nearest planetary neighbour, Venus is often considered Earth's sister planet. After all, they're both about the same size and they have a similar mass and diameter. They were formed out of the same materials and under similar conditions. In fact, Venus once excited speculation that it could host the first human colony in space. See, scientists thought the dense cloud cover meant lots of rain. After all, it's closer to the sun than the Earth, so temperatures are a lot hotter, which should mean more water evaporation and therefore more rain clouds. So scientists envisioned that under its thick cloud cover, Earth's sister planet was covered in lush, tropical green rainforests, a sort of Amazon jungle on steroids. Some even speculated that tropical rainforests could somehow have meant a planet full of dinosaurs. After all, they ruled the Earth for far longer than humans. But then reality sets in. If Venus was Earth's sister planet, it's a twisted sister. In fact, Soviet and American probes have revealed that Venus is the closest place to hell in our solar system. It's developed a runaway greenhouse effect. Its surface is scorchingly hot, with an average temperature of 462 degrees Celsius. That's hot enough to melt lead. And those thick, opaque planet-shrouding clouds, well, they do cause rain, but it's not water. Instead, it's droplets of metal-eating sulfuric acid. Scientists have even seen what looks like snow caps on some of Venus's taller mountain ranges. But the snow isn't frozen water, it's metallic. The clouds are so heavy they crush Venus's rich carbon dioxide-based atmosphere like a lid on a pressure cooker, and giving the planet a surface pressure some 92 times greater than the average sea level surface pressure on Earth. The surface of Venus is dominated by volcanoes. A last count, there are over 1,600 volcanic structures, more than any other planet in the solar system. Its surface is 90% basalt and consists of a mosaic of volcanic lava plains, showing evidence of regular periodic resurfacing by floods of magma. This all indicates that volcanism has played a major role in shaping Venus's surface. So, the intense pressure, heat and corrosive gases of Venus's surface are enough to disable even the most robust spacecraft in a matter of hours. But a few dozen kilometres overhead, that thick atmosphere is far more hospitable to robotic exploration. And one idea scientists are looking at envisions pairing a balloon with a Venus orbiter, the two working in tandem to study Earth's sister planet. While the orbiter would remain far above the atmosphere, taking science measurements and serving as a communications relay, the aerial robotic balloon, or aerobot, about 12 metres in diameter, would travel through the upper atmosphere. To test this concept, scientists and engineers from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, and from the Near Space Corporation in Oregon, recently carried out two successful flight tests of a prototype balloon. The shimmering silver 4-metre-wide balloon ascended to more than 4,000 feet, about a kilometre over Nevada's Black Rock Desert. 
It's a region of the Earth's atmosphere that approximates the temperature and density the aerobot would experience at 180,000 feet or 55 kilometres above the Venusian surface. The only balloon-borne exploration of the Venusian atmosphere so far were part of the Soviet Union's twin Vega 1 and 2 missions, which arrived at the planet in 1985. The two balloons, which were about 3.6 metres in diameter each, were filled with helium and lasted for a little over 46 hours before their instruments and batteries ran out. But their short time in the Venusian atmosphere provided a tantalising hint of the science that could be achieved with a larger, longer-duration balloon platform floating within the planet's atmosphere. The ultimate goal of the aerobot would be to travel on the Venusian winds, floating from east to west, circumnavigating the planet for at least 100 days. The aerobot would serve as a platform for a range of science investigations, from monitoring the atmosphere for acoustic waves generated by Venus quakes to analysing the chemical composition of the clouds. The accompanying orbiter would receive data from the aerobot and relay that information back to Earth, while at the same time providing a global view of the planet. Much like a Mars rover is commanded to drive to an interesting rock or other feature on the red planet, the aerobot could be directed to raise or lower its altitude, something the Vega balloons couldn't do. That would allow them to conduct science between 171,000 and 203,000 feet, that's 52 to 62 kilometres above the Venusian surface. The prototype balloons that flew over Nevada were fabricated as a balloon within a balloon, using a rigid inner reservoir filled with helium under high pressure and an encapsulating outer helium balloon that can be expanded or contracted. To increase altitude, helium would be vented from the inner reservoir into the outer balloon, which then expands to give the aerobot additional buoyancy. When it's time to reduce altitude, the helium is pumped back into the reservoir, causing the outer balloon to shrink and decrease the aerobot's buoyancy. While this region of Venus's atmosphere would be more forgiving than lower areas, long-duration flights in the planet's caustic clouds would still be no picnic, as the clouds contain sulfuric acid and other corrosive chemicals. So, the multi-layered material developed for the aerobot's outer balloon casing includes an acid-proof coating, a metallization layer to reduce solar heating, and a structural inner layer that keeps it strong enough to carry the science instruments below. New techniques have also been developed to ensure a long-duration acid-proof seal with minimal helium leakage from the seams. All the team need now is permission to go. A United States Space Force X-37B space shuttle has successfully returned to Earth following a record-breaking 908 days in orbit. The unmanned space plane glided autonomously to a perfect landing on the space shuttle runway at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. It was the sixth mission for the winged spacecraft, which carried a series of classified experiments for NASA and the U.S. military. This was also the first X-37B mission to carry a separate service module, a ring attached to the rear of the shuttle holding additional experiments. The module was jettisoned before the space shuttle deorbited to ensure a safe landing. Among the non-classified payloads aboard the OTV-6 mission were a Naval Research Laboratory photovoltaic radio frequency antenna module, which harnessed solar rays from outside the Earth's atmosphere and transmitted radio frequency microwave energy down to the Earth's surface as a power source. Also aboard was the US Air Force Falcon Sat-8 satellite, which was successfully deployed into orbit. OTV-6 also carried several NASA experiments, including the Materials Exposure and Technology Innovation in Space, or METIS-2 package, which included thermal control coatings, printed electronic materials, and potential radiation shielding blankets. METIS-1, which flew on the previous X-37B mission OTV-5, also included sample plates mounted on the flight vehicle. Another NASA experiment on OTV-6 investigated the effect of long-duration space exposure on plant seeds to see how well they handle exposure in the space environment. These could eventually be used to grow food for people to eat. First launched in 2010, the two reusable unmanned X-37Bs were built by Boeing as scaled-down versions of NASA's manned space shuttle fleet. They were designed to be small enough to fit in the space shuttle's payload bay and then deployed once in orbit. But their real ability is to easily change orbits and flight attitudes in space, making them difficult to track and allowing them to undertake clandestine missions against enemy assets. This is Space Time.
And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. Scientists at the University of Houston have developed a new vaccine which targets the dangerous synthetic opioid fentanyl. The vaccine could block the ability of the drug to enter the brain, thus eliminating its high. The breakthrough discovery reported in the journal Pharmaceuticals could have major implications for America's opioid epidemic by becoming a relapse prevention agent for people trying to quit the habit. While opioid use is treatable, an estimated 80% of those dependent on the drug suffer relapse. In fact, over 150 Americans die every day from overdoses of synthetic opioids, including fentanyl, which is 50 times stronger than heroin and 100 times stronger than morphine. Consumption of just 2 milligrams of fentanyl, that's the size of 2 grains of rice, is likely to be fatal, depending on a person's size. The new vaccine generates anti-fentanyl antibodies that bind to the consumed fentanyl, preventing it from entering the brain and allowing it to be eliminated out of the body through the kidneys. Thus, the individual will not feel its euphoric effects. And in another positive finding, the vaccine didn't cause any adverse side effects. A new study warns that large dams could be separating platypus communities, thus increasing the risk of inbreeding and further threatening the already highly endangered species. A report in the journal Communications Biology examined the genetic makeup of multiple platypus in both free-flowing rivers and those with large dams. These included the free-flowing Ovens River along with the Dan Mitamita River and the free-flowing Tenterfield Creek, along with the nearby Severn River, which is regulated by a large dam. Researchers say they found greater genetic differentiation between platypuses above and below large dams compared to those in rivers without dams, which suggests that large dams are a significant barrier to platypus movements. Importantly, this genetic differentiation increased over time since the dam was built, reflecting the long-term impacts of the dam. China has developed its own copy of America's stealth bomber. Beijing sees its new H-20 bomber as the answer to the US B-2 Spirit and B-21 Raider stealth bombers. Earlier reports suggest the A-20 is a range of about 8,500 kilometres, which will double the country's strike range. The H-20's primary mission would be the delivery of air-launched nuclear missiles. The Qualcomm Snapdragon Summit's just wrapped up in Hawaii, where new-generation chips, augmented reality glasses and next-generation sound platforms are all the rage. Technology editor Alex Harovroit from ITY.com is there, and he joins us now. Well, it's an annual summit I've held over the past few years that talks about all the latest developments in not only smartphone CPUs, but these days the CPUs that are used in ARM-powered Windows 11 computers and also the chips that are used in the various virtual reality headsets. I've got a, a reference platform for a new augmented reality headset that will come out in a few years' time. I guess they're still working on it. And and uh, also processors for things like chips in cars. So their brand new flagship processor is the Snapdragon 8 Generation 2, Gen 2. And uh, there will be a phone that has this processor by the end of the year. But it's also the chip we should see in the various Samsung Galaxy S23 models. But of course, all the different companies like uh, Asus and uh, Sony and Sharp, Oppo, OnePlus, uh, Xiaomi, Motorola, etc., a lot of others, those other companies will also be using this chip. It's their flagship processor, and uh, it's got incredible new AI capabilities, uh, new 5G modems inside, uh, incredible new gaming capabilities. In fact, there is this ray tracing capability, and they showed demos of what this looks like, and the colors and the, the uh, amount of light that is bouncing off images. You can even see reflections in items for things that are off screen, like the, the player's face. Uh, and uh, just they were showing with the ray tracing on and the ray tracing off. And when the ray tracing was off, it was very sort of flat and uh, it was still very colorful and looked incredible. But when the ray tracing was on, it took on this extra level of sort of reality. And ray tracing was something that's only been released in the past two or three years with some of the desktop graphics cards. So to have this in your phone, in the palm of your hand, is uh, pretty amazing. They also had uh, new Snapdragon sound chips, the version 3 and version 5. They've got spatial audio head tracking. They've got 48K lossless music support. They've got the lowest ever latency at 48 millisecond 
second. So it just makes it very responsive. There's also a new feature from a company called Trinamics, which has uh, been spun off out of Germany's BASF. And what they've done is quite amazing. They've got a new facial recognition system similar to Face ID on Apple's devices, which has been available for you know, half a decade or more now. But where Trinamics is one is different is that, well, there's two things that are quite different. They were showing how that a very advanced mask, that is the replica of somebody's face, can fool a lot of devices. They were claiming it could even fool the iPhone. But they have a new skin detection capability within their devices and this new liveliness detector where this mask with the liveliness detector off, it fools the camera system. But with this liveliness detector on, uh, it denied access. And what's even more amazing about this little sensor is that it sits under the OLED screen. So there's no more need for a notch. Now, they don't do cameras as well. So you might still have a punch hole or the pinhole sort of camera you see on many of the Android devices. But on iPhones, you have that little dynamic island. looks a bit like a, a pill shape. And uh, so Apple has not yet been able to hide either the camera or the face ID sensor behind the glass. But the Trinamics people have, and they're giving a demo. And they, they said that the, the first smartphones to come out with this from Android sadly won't come until 2024. We might see some late next year, I guess. But it takes a while for the companies to put these things into motion. I asked about pricing and they say, well, we can't tell you the exact pricing. I mean, obviously we'll tell the smartphone makers, but it's similar in price. The ultrasonic underscreen fingerprint sensor. We also saw great advances with the ARM processor that's used in Windows PCs. And an ARM processor means that you don't have to have a fan. You've got very long battery life. You've got 5G built in. And they were showing this new AI capability whereby the video calls that you make on Zoom or Teams or other things, there was no noise in the background. The demonstration was someone turning all those noise cancelling features off and then you could hear the rustling of wind and people in the background, the noises. But as soon as it turned it on, all you heard was the voice. The AI chip inside Qualcomm's new system also meant that the CPU and the graphics processing unit didn't have to do any of these sort of calculations. It was all handled by this new AI chip. So lots of advances from Qualcomm. I mean, they've got a lot of competition from Apple with their ARM processors. And of course, they have competition from the traditional Intel and AMD x86 processors. Competition's always good. Never hurts. And, you know, that means that no company can rest on its laurels. That's Alex Saharov-Royd from ity.com. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 